what's up ladies and gentlemen? So yes, today we're going to be doing a horoscope of Princess Diana and we're going to be looking at some of the methods and secrets of astrology that will reveal some of the things that Princess Diana may not have shared with the world. So we're going to look at that aspect, we're going to look at why her marriage failed and what was her marriage really about. You know, and including other things and aspects, you know, from education to family life, siblings, parents, all of that. Okay, because I'm going to be starting to use some unique, unique methods of astrology that hardly anybody uses. Okay, and this is going to be fun. So this way you can look at yourself and your own chart and you can see, oh my God, he is right. These things actually work. Okay, but make sure to check out the link below before anything for my book so you can see your chart. All right. So, and, and yes, by the way, I am dressed today. I'm looking very nice for Princess Diana. Well, actually, no, it's not for Princess Diana. I'm getting a sex change operation, so I have to go in about an hour. No, come on, I kid you guys. I'm not going to get a sex change operation without telling you guys ahead of time. No, 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 no. Today is actually my and Jamie's anniversary because today we met back in time somewhere back in time okay so i'm taking her to a nice steakhouse dinner here in la and hopefully she likes it i'm gonna go pick her up from work and uh, we're gonna go so yeah celebrating with the man okay so princess diana's horoscope princess diana was born on uh, july 1st uh, 1961 at 7 45 p.m in um, United Kingdom, some weird city, I don't know, I forgot the name. But it was so funny that on her Wikipedia, they had her time of birth. I don't know if you guys noticed that. Forget even like all the other places. It was right on Wikipedia, like on her, in her biography, she's born at 7.45 p.m. I mean, what's so special about this particular profile that they decided to put the time of birth? But hey, helped me and, uh, you know, makes uh, things a lot easier. But uh, Princess Diana, as you see her chart, was born with a Scorpio Ascendant. She was a Scorpio Ascendant, okay? Now, you'll be like, oh my God, Princess Diana is Scorpio. That cannot be possible. She was so sweet and nice and, you know. But the thing is, you got to realize, a personality is a three-dimensional thing. Personality is formed by the placement of the sun, placement of the moon, and your ascendant sign. And if you see her, she's a Scorpio ascendant, Aquarius moon, and Gemini sun. Okay, according to this true Vedic astrological calculative method. So it shows that her physical body, her ego was of a Scorpio. She was very intense about her things. When she wanted to do something, she really wanted to just do something. Okay, and the way you can see this is that the Lord of Scorpio, Mars, is in the 10th house with Rahu. So she had tremendous amount of uh, determination, dedication, and willpower. Her willpower, I'm telling you, it was like off, it's off the charts. Princess Diana willpower is off the charts. You know, and her throughout her life, her aim, her life's aim was this status, was about status. Of course, we don't share things like this. She will not share things like this. She was prohibited from sharing any truly personal aspect of her life. And especially in royal family, you know, you can, you got to really have these, you know, constitution that you go by. But her life since childhood was about status. She was looking for rank. She wanted to rank and she wanted to be something important. That was an internal life goal. But in her chart, she has Jupiter and Saturn in the third house. And Jupiter is debilitated in the sign of Capricorn. She has Moon and Ketu in the fourth house in the sign of Aquarius. Then she has Venus in the seventh house of marriage in its own sign of Taurus, Sun and Mercury in the eighth house of Gemini. And then, as obviously, Rahu and Mars in the 10th house in the sign of Leo. Okay, so this is basically her basic chart. But so when we're starting out with the first house, her personality 
was not only shaped by being intense and being that soldier, that determined soldier, she was also very about much about reaching out to large organization for the betterment of the world, okay? And she was a communicator. She was a communicator of those things. So she had this personality of Scorpio, Aquarius, and Gemini. And this is why we're multidimensional. This is why we're sometimes, we're, we're molding these three aims, these three, you know, dimensions in our horoscope and we're presenting it to the world. So we can be intense. Okay, I have this nonprofit organization that is supposed to help the uh, unprivileged people. Okay, how do I do this? That's her ascendant. Okay, then the moon. Moon is planning. Moon is thinking. Moon is about, okay, how do I reach out to these organizations and how do I, you know, lift the world up? Let's, let's make this a better place. Let's, let's go out and help people. That's the Aquarius thinking, you know, like thinking worldly. Then you have sun in Scorpio in, in the uh, sign of Gemini with Mercury. So, and the eighth house is a house of emergencies, house of sudden ups and downs, house of transformation, house of the occult, house of secrets, okay? So what this shows that her part of her personality was to communicate about secrets, communicate about things that are hidden underground, people, things that are, uh, people are not paying attention to. And if you look at her life, she was the one and really went out and exposed this whole epidemic of AIDS and HIV back in the 80s and 90s. She was the one who got the attention. She's like, what are you doing? Come here, look. She was holding these babies with AIDS, with all sorts of diseases. So she exposed this emergency. She exposed through, through her communication, through her actions. She exposed these things that the world wasn't paying attention to. You know, so that's how you can see the molding of the three personalities. But let's talk about, first of all, her parents. Princess Diana, I don't know if you've seen a biography, but she had not such a good relationship with the mother, distant relationship with the mother. I mean, the father too, it was constant ups and downs. Constant ups and downs, okay? So in her main birth chart, whenever you're looking at the relationship, how a relationship with the mother is going to be, you're going to pay attention to the fourth house, the planet that rules the fourth house, and the significator of the fourth house, which is the mother. And in her chart, moon is the significator of mother for everyone. In her fourth house, moon is in the fourth house in the sign of Aquarius. Okay, so the Lord of Aquarius is Saturn. And then you have the south node Ketu sitting there with Mars. And moon is receiving three negative malefic aspects without any benefic aspects. Moon received the aspects of Mars, Rahu, and it's sitting with Ketu. So what Ketu is doing is showing this detached relationship with, from the mother. But why? Why is it showing detached relationship with the mother? Well, for that, look at the fact that it's in the sign of Aquarius, meaning that mother was in her own life trying to organize organizations and she was dissatisfied with her own life would gradually transformed into the relationship which she had with her daughter. And then Mars and Rahu in the sign of, in the 10th house, in the sign of Leo, looking at Moon in the 4th house, shows that there was this lot of superficial, artificial things that were happening in her home that just distanted her relationship from the father. Okay. Oh, not, I'm sorry, not from the father, but from the mother. Due to mother ha having to work, there was a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility on the mother and mother had to go out and be a soldier and like work to make things happen. And because of that, the relationship was detached. Now, how was the relationship with the father? Well, the relationship with the father is seen with the 10th house, planets in the 10th house and the significator of the 10th house, which is what? Significator of father in everybody's chart is son. But for Diana, Sun is in the 8th house. And in the 10th house, they have Mars and Rahu. Okay? And even though Mars is a friend of Sun, but Mars is a natural malefic, he brings power struggle. So wherever Mars is placed, that's where you're going to have power struggle. 
So you can see that Princess Diana, although her relationship with her father was a far better, however, she had this power struggle with her father. Because Mars is in the 10th house and Rahu is there, amplifying the energy of Mars. And then Sun itself, the significator of father, is in the 8th house of transformation and ups and downs. And so it's through with the father, there's these sudden ups and downs. One day she had a great conversation with the father and the next day she's like, what the hell are you doing? But that's not exactly how you see a relationship in Vedic astrology. You have to go deeper. You have to see exactly what is happening. You know, what's happening with the mother and father. For that, you go to the divisional charts that represents your parents. Okay, so we're going to look at the divisional chart of Princess Diana. Okay, it's called the Dwadamsha chart. And this chart is going to show the relationship of, with the uh, mother and father. Now here, as you can see, again, for Dwadamsha, you're looking at the 4th and 10th house. Because 4th house is the mother, 10th house is the father, and then the significator of each, which is sun and moon. So let's look at her Dwadamsha chart. Okay, if you see, moon is in the 6th house, the significator of mother, and 6th house is a house of conflict. It's a house of dealing with lots of conflicts and disagreements. Then Saturn is sitting there with the moon. And even though Saturn is his own sign, again, if you have been watching my videos, Aquarius and Scorpios are two karmic signs that represents a lot of karmic backlog. So the sixth house, which is known as the house of arg arguments and enemies, moon is sitting there with Saturn, which is natural enemy, Moon is receiving an aspect from Mars from the third house, meaning that Mars was pushing it, pushing a lot of will, a lot of the effort, like Diana had to really use a lot of effort to work the relationship with the mother. Okay, so that's how you would judge a relationship with the mother. Now look at the relationship with the father. Now fa the son is in the fourth house of mother in the sign of uh, Sagittarius. So it shows that, okay, if you had to really weigh who was having a better, who had the better relationship with Diana, it was actually the father. She She's like, you know what? Out of the worst of the both, my father actually just did provide me some, some nourishment. You know, my father did ha communicate with me a bit, even though he was strict. Because Saturn in the sign of Sagittarius becomes like that strict guru. Okay, so that's how you judge if the relationship with the parents were good or not. Now let's move on to her next uh, cycle, which is her marriage. Why, what happened with her marriage? How do you judge that? Now when judging a marriage, whether you're a male or female, you're going to look at three things. You're going to look at the seventh house and what's happening in the seventh house. Then you're going to look at condition of Venus and Jupiter. Okay, and especially for women, you're looking at Jupiter. Because in astrology, not Mars, but Jupiter is the significator of the husband. Why? Because a woman will only marry a guy who can become the father of her children. And the significator of children in astrology is Jupiter. So obviously, a woman will look for the Jupiterian nature. Jupiterian quality because a woman is also looking her husband as a guidance as a teacher as a guru So Jupiter also becomes that so not only Jupiter provides the kids He can also be the guru at the same time. So you got to look at these three things. So in Diana's chart The seventh house has Venus in it in Taurus beautifully placed Okay, but That's not how you would judge it now you would see as to what's happening with Jupiter. Well, Jupiter is debilitated, okay? Jupiter is debilitated in the sign of Capricorn. And Jupiter shows the nature of the husband. What will husband do? And Capricorn is a sign of government, sign of rank, okay? Sign of working, workship. So first of all, it shows a debilitated Jupiter shows that the husband would be very cunning. So husband could be an alcoholic, husband could be doing, you know, shady things in life, okay? And then Saturn is sitting with it. So now, here's the thing, for all the Vedic astrology lovers out there, you're gonna be saying that, hey, Saturn has Nietzsche Bhang Raj Yoga, meaning that the cancellation of Saturn, uh, uh, Jupiter is, debilit is canceled because it's sitting with its lower lord, Saturn. Saturn rules Aquarius and Capricorn. 
and Saturn is in the third house. So obviously you should give a good husband. No, I've said it again and I'll say it again and I'll say it in the future again. Nietzsche Bhangraj Yoga does not fix everything. It only provides a pro a pro professionally on any aspect. Jupiter would give good results. Jupiter would provide the best results. But when it comes to personal life, Jupiter is going to be giving the debilitated aspect. And if you notice, Saturn has the lowest degrees in this conjunction of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And if you saw my, if you read my book, as Conjunctions at the Speed of Light, I tell you, the planet of the lowest degrees has the most say and becomes the most strongest. So not only Saturn is in conjunction with Jupiter and Jupiter's debilitated, but Saturn has been the most say, meaning that the husband will throw upon tremendous amount of responsibility, tremendous amount of organization, structure, and it's going to be demanding a lot from Diana. That's what the husband's going to be. But here's another thing. That's not how you would also judge the marriage. You can also judge the marriage by placing moon into the ascendant. Now, if you place moon into the ascendant, guess who goes into the seventh house? Mars and Rahu. And what do Mars and Rahu show? First of all, Mars is going to bring a very aggressive husband. And Mars is in the fifth sign, Leo, which is a regal sign, royal sign. So it's a royal soldier or somebody who is in the government, who is in the who has a kingdom, who works for the king. And obviously, Prince Charles was in the military, was a general, and then became a prince. And also, Rahu is sitting there. That tells you what? That this is a very superficial marriage. Rahu brings illusion. And too malefic in the seventh house, in a sign of royalness, shows there's a lot of illusion that's happening to show, to express that sign. Rahu puts this illusion in expressing that sign. So like, let's say your favorite actor, Tom Cruise, or let's say your Indian favorite actor, Amitabh Bachchan. People treat them like God, like they're God. They're the best thing in the world. But if you really look at it in reality, they're just actors in front of the camera, acting, talking like I am doing. And that's it. They just have too many people following them and they become gods. Same thing here. Rahu in the seventh house, bringing a very superficial husband who looks regal, who looks nice. But in personal life, it's totally different. It's becoming that snake type mentality, snake type person. So this is why you can't just judge a marriage from the, the ascendant. Judge it from moon and sun as well. Okay. But that's not exactly what will tell us exactly what's happening with our marriage. You go to the divisional charts that represents marriage, which is what? The Nimansha chart, the D9 chart. Now, if you look at our D9 chart, she has Sun and Saturn aspect on the seventh house because Sun and Saturn are sitting in her ascendant in Aquarius. Again, karmic backlog. And their aspect, two malefics looking in the seventh house. Bringing a sense of duty onto the marriage. Like marriage becomes a duty. Like this is a duty that I have to do. I'm not really in love. I'm not really, you know, doing any um, benefit to myself. I just have to do it because it's been asked to me. But Jupiter looks at the seventh house. If you notice, Jupiter sees the seventh house from the third house of Aries. Meaning, guess what? Again, if you watch my Jupiter in the sign of Aries video, Meaning a very demanding husband, very straightforward, headstrong husband. So although Jupiter is bringing his positivity and Saturn is bringing that longness, like Saturn always aspect on the seventh house, always actually prolongs the marriage. It makes it very long lasting. But after analyzing the F and Lagna chart and this chart, there is just too much burden of malefic planets and malefic signs. Because Aries is a Tamasic sign. Okay? So this is why you have to see why, what planet is doing what. You know, and by judging the two planets, it shows that, okay, marriage will happen. Marriage is going to work, but it's going to be superficial. So how long will that last? You know, this is how, this is how you see it. And I, can, I would love to go into the Dasha. She, was, she got married in the Mahadasha of Rahu and Antar Dasha of Moon. Now from Moon chart, Rahu is in the seventh house of marriage. 
So obviously Rahu brought that. And moon aspects the seventh house from the moon Rashi chart. So moon is also influencing that. And she was married in the Pariyantra Dasha of Venus. Venus who's already sitting in the seventh house in her birth chart. So sun, moon, Rahu, three of them triggering the marriage. But I can do more of these things, you know, once you go into the detail, but then it'll be a 60 minute horoscope. Now, let's go to her education. Princess Diana wasn't really good in education. She did kind of below average. She wasn't really fond of, you know, learning and education. Why? Again, look at her birth chart. Okay, her lagna chart. Jupiter is debilitated. One of the strongest significator of education is debilitated. Sitting in the third house of discomfort. So discomfort through education, discomfort through gurus, discomfort to preachers, from preachers. You know, so she felt his discomfort with them. And Saturn is sitting with it. And Saturn is a delayer of things. Saturn kind of halts things. Saturn puts responsibility on you. Saturn puts pressure on you. It brings fear and an anxiety. And since Saturn has the lowest degree, Saturn is putting more of that on Jupiter. So when it comes to education, she just feels like, oh my God, oh my God, I can't do this. I hate this. Like doing just a simple English homework would be like tremendous daunting task for her. And then Mercury is in the eighth house with Sun. So Mercury is not combust. Mercury is heated. It's just heated, okay, in its own sign. And then Mercury has an aspect from Ketu in the 8th house. Ketu is detachment. Ketu detaches you from things. And Mercury is about education, writing, speaking, speech, okay. So what it did, the two significator of education, you know, detached it. So Saturn brings detachment, sitting with Jupiter. Ketu brings detachment aspecting Mercury in the 8th house with hot and burning sun. Okay, so this is how you can see what is happening to uh, her education. Not to mention Jupiter rules her 5th house of education. So when Jupiter is ruling the 5th house and it's, uh, it's uh, debilitated, sitting with Saturn, I mean, there's going to be a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of effort needed in order to complete any educational type thing. But let's not stay in superficial things. Let's go deeper into her D24 chart, her divisional chart, which opens up the educational fifth house and it shows, or educational fourth house more, more likely, and it shows what is really happening with her education, okay? Now, if you notice, this chart shows a Pisces ascendant and Jupiter is in the second house in the sign of Aries. And so what you're looking for here is you're looking for the condition of Jupiter, Mercury, and the fourth house. Okay, not people think it's a fifth house, but it's really the fourth house you're looking at. But you could also judge the fifth house because fifth house wasn't really considered the house of education before, but now it is. Okay, but look at this. The two most common things. First of all, Mercury is debilitated in the sign of Pisces. Second, Jupiter is in the second house, doesn't aspect any of the educational houses. And it's in the sign of Aries, meaning that her true education came through her own self, through her own efforts, through her own motivational psyche. That was her education. So you see, when you're judging these things, you have to go to the divisional charts and look and see, is it really happening or not? And so, and the reason why I show this to you, so now you can go back in your own life and you can see this. Okay, what happened here? What happened here? What happened here? You know, the only aspect I won't go into is her death, you know, because first of all, I don't tell you exactly how to predict death. But if you use my concept of moon Rashi, sun Rashi and her Lagna, you'll see why her death occurred in 1996, because the three Marka houses became active from moon, sun or the Lagna chart. But I don't want to get into that and not getting to any of the other things that I kind of discovered in that. But wanted to just give you the marriage, parents, and 
her education so you can see what exactly is happening okay so guys this is my analysis of princess diana's horoscope if you don't know my channel subscribe below and if you want to know what's happening with your education how's your relationship with the parents and who you're going to marry and if you're going to marry as you know like a scam artist or something then check out the link below check out my books there astrology at the speed of light and conjunctions at the speed of light and when you get these books i will send you the link look at your own charts make sure you follow the directions below otherwise we'll see you on monday Bye bye